I think we might need a bit of a scenery change before I start recording this video, Jesus. Well, good day, folks. It's uh, new video time, the uh, update video time, actually, specifically. Haven't done one of these in a while. Thought I'd catch everybody up on what's been going on. Got a couple things to talk about. And then I think as an added bonus, we're going to test a couple computers since I happened to get a couple extras from the thrift store owner just yesterday, actually. And we'll get into those once the end of the video starts approaching because I'm going to save that stuff for later. But in any case, um, well, let's just get to rambling here. So this used to be my daily driver, and I say used to because it no longer is. This is the 2006 Dodge Dakota that I was driving for a long time, ever since we had gotten it. And now, unfortunately, it stays parked for, at least right now, until we eventually get it in somewhere and have it looked into. Basically, the gist of it is uh, the reason why it has decided to be parked here and not you know, be driven for a little while mainly comes down to, well, it made this really awful noise on Friday, well, a Friday, it was last last Friday, actually, and, well, as I'm making this video last Friday, and trying to drive it home was a bit of a questionable affair. See, basically, when I was driving it after I'd gotten off work, the, oh, excuse me, the rear end made this really questionable crunching sound, and I could probably bet you it came from somewhere, I would assume, in the differential, because that's kind of where I think it came from. I don't know, I mean, if I look down here, you can obviously see there's no holes in the differential cover. There's nothing missing, but it sure felt like something internally went crunch. And so, yeah, it was a pretty sketchy fare trying to drive this thing home because I was trying to drive it and it felt like something was locking up. Like I couldn't move the truck because it wouldn't let me. It's like I tried to let off the clutch slowly and the dang thing was just not really wanting to move. So. It was really strange, but luckily it seemed to have smoothened out enough to where I could drive it home 70 miles. So, okay, that might seem like that's good. You know, obviously it must've just been a rock stuck in the rotor is what I thought at the time, but no, of course it wasn't. So on Saturday, the next day, when I was going to make another trip because I was going to go sell something, when all of a sudden, as I was getting on the highway, got it up to 60 miles per hour, next thing you know, I hear a ding the ABS light comes on and the brake light comes on in the dashboard and my speedometer is now frozen at 60 miles per hour. So I thought, well, that's really annoyingly strange. So I had to take my truck back home and I had to, of course, drive my grandma's car, which as you can probably tell is over there. So basically that really ruined my morning because I didn't know what the heck was going on with my truck. So I was like, okay, this thing's got to go into a shop. I don't know what's going on with it. So then come Monday, when I need to go take it into the shop, this happens. I think I still got a clip of it. I'll insert it now. So all I can hear right now is thunk, thunk, thunk. And currently the speed it is not very accurate at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I think my truck is in good health, boys. Yeah, not a very happy sounding uh, rear differential or whatever was going on on the rear end now, wasn't it? And I had to limp it that way to the shop about five miles per hour in first gear with no power from the throttle trying to limp it over to the shop and I was able to get it over there. It was moving under its own power, so that much was fine. So heaven forbid, I don't know what's well and truly going on. So my theory is it might not necessarily be the differential because if it can still move under its own power, then the differential, at least in theory, is not completely destroyed. If it is destroyed in some manner, I think maybe it could just be something in the axle. I don't know. I'm no car mechanic. I didn't have anybody tear into any of the componentry in the rear end to specifically look for a problem. At least we're planning on doing that sometime soon. That's the idea. But as of right now, we haven't done so just because it's a lot of uh, shop time, I'm sure, to try to get this thing in. And wow, this thing has really developed an interesting pattern on the tire. It almost looks like it was cracking, but it's not because these are fairly new tires. Anyways, getting distracted. And also by that. Because everybody's got to drive noisy freaking diesel trucks around here. Anyways, I digress. So... For right now, since we don't know what's wrong with it, I'm just gonna leave it parked. 
because there's no sense in me trying to assume what's wrong with it and then it just kind of sits here because I'm too lazy to try to fix it by throwing money into it. So basically, to summarize things with enough basically's and so's, I'm letting my grandmother take it back because I, while I do like the truck, it's just too much money for me right now to throw into it to keep it driving, at least in a sense where it's not going from the rear end when you're trying to drive it because that's obviously not good. And yeah, it's otherwise fine. I've kept up with it. Like, I've, like I said, these tires are fairly recent. These ones on the front are a little more worn just because I got those at the start of the year. Oh my God, those dogs are f***ing annoying. Why is it that we have a repeating combo of really annoyingly loudly barking dogs? Jesus. Anyways, now that the dogs have settled down a bit. Yeah, front tires were put on at the start of the year. They're a bit more worn. There used to be a set of four matching, but I had a tire blowout off the driver's side rear on my way to work one morning, which was not fun. I think it probably developed some kind of slow leak and then eventually just blew out because the rubber got too hot and so it just blew out from the sidewall. Anyways, so that was a very expensive job. At least the rim is still fine. I don't know how it managed to survive, but it did. So in any case, yeah. This leads me to my next thing because of course, since this thing's parked, I have no way of getting to and from work, at least without borrowing somebody else's vehicle. So the solution was, to buy a used vehicle because that's really all I could do. I don't have the money to buy a brand new one. Are you kidding me? Nor do I have the credit history to do so. So what that meant for me was having to find a dealership that had a nice car or nice enough that I could deal with car. And luckily, my brother's working at a dealership that sells new and used cars. And he's a pretty good salesman, in my opinion. You know, he probably could be better or worse than some others. But I digress at the end of the day. We managed to get myself into something that's pretty nice. And you probably saw it peeking around in the video a little bit. But this is the car. This is my new vehicle, well, used vehicle, to use for at least the foreseeable future until I get something else. This is the 2013 Ford Escape SE all-wheel drive. And just got this uh, yesterday, actually, when picked it up. I had the deal secured on Wednesday but I was obviously working and I didn't want to take the time off work to have to come and get the car if I didn't have to. And it was stuck in detail anyway, so it was actually probably a good thing that I waited. Well, I mean, subjectively, you'll probably soon see why once I start pointing out some of the stuff. But in any case, bugs accumulated. Whoop, hang on. I got to fix the autofocus because I forgot to do that last time. But uh, yeah, bugs definitely accumulated on the front. So yay. My autofocus is not fixing itself. Well, that's really annoying. Hang on. There we go, autofocus is fixed. So yeah, 160 some odd miles of highway driving will definitely get the bugs attached. So I'm gonna have to clean that off at some point. The color is called Seafoam Green, as I believe it is called from Ford. And honestly, I know personal preferences are going to differ, but I really like the color. At least personally, I do. I mean, you see these on Ford Fusions, yes, but honestly, it suits the Escape quite well. And now, as you can see, we've got double trouble in the driveway because we have two escapes of the same generation. Although my grandma's is a 2015 and mine's a 2013. Now, being that this is an SE, there are some differences comparatively to my grandmother's trim, meaning that I don't have some of the luxuries like leather interior and heated leather seats. Woo, don't really care about that. Uh, this one does not have the 18 inch aluminum alloys like my grandmother's car does. So, Mine has 17 inch aluminum alloys sitting on 235 55R17 tires. And the rims could use a little bit of an extra clean because like I said, this was kind of rushed in detail. So they didn't quite get everything, which is slightly annoying because my car was sold on Wednesday and I picked it up on Saturday and they still didn't have the damn thing done. I guess that's what happens when you get Mexican cheap labor. I'm not being racist. I'm just stating that how it is. So anyways, you can take that how you will. But the rims themselves, there's a little bit of missing paint, probably for some curb rash or rocks or whatever, but the rims themselves are in really good shape. It's just the finish that's been chipped away a little bit. And since this is all wheel drive, all the tires match. And this does have fog lights, surprisingly. I didn't think it did, but it does. What also surprises me is that they actually ordered 
a panoramic sunroof on this one with the roof racks, which my grandmother's car does not have the roof racks, nor does it have the sunroof, but this one does have those. So that's pretty nice. As far as some other things that my Escape does not have compared to my grandmother's, uh, my grandmother's Escape has the 1.6 liter EcoBoost turbo four cylinder. I believe it's 180 horsepower. Don't quote me on that. I think that's the number. I know for a fact mine has the two liter EcoBoost four cylinder with 240 horsepower and 270 foot pounds of torque. The same engine that they put in the Fusion alongside all wheel drive. Nice, there's another dog out. You'll have to probably forgive me, the detailing was not the best and I've also kind of stayed in this car for the past day, so it's not gonna be the most clean, but you'll kind of get an idea as to how this car looks. So as I mentioned, this does not have the leather interior. This has a two-tone, uh, sort of a dark black and gray cloth interior. It's not heated. They're just standard seats, which is fine. One thing I do like is this trim is not like a glossy veneer looking plastic. This is just a standard semi-gloss, sort of a grayish silver. And it's got a matte plastic in here and it doesn't have obsessive amounts of glossy plastic everywhere, which means less abilities for stuff to get fingerprinted or scratched and reflect right into my eyes as I'm driving. That's just nice to have. The door panel cards are also all black to match, which is nice. There is soft touch material here, which is the same thing as my grandmother's escape. This one does not have the, uh, the like the keyless entry fob thingamajig, which is a push button start like my grandmother's does. Uh, with the little pads on the outside of the door. This one actually has a physical key that you stick in the ignition. I think that was the thing with the SEs. That was an option, I think, on the SEL where you had the little fob with the remote start on it. Although I think these could have been probably ordered with remote start, but mine doesn't have it. So anytime you want to hop in, you have to use the almighty original key. So I mean, it's whatever. Mine also, uh, for quirks and features mentioning, I guess. Uh, this one has the option where you can kick your foot under the bumper if you have the key in your pocket and it will automatically open up the lift gate. Mine, you have to physically lift it with the button on the back. And there's no power closing mechanism either. So you have to grab it by the handle, which is fine. Honestly, again, those are little nitpicks and I don't really care too much because that stuff would probably break anyway. But yeah, you can see as far as the detailing goes, they did miss a little bit. There's a little bit of grunge up in here and on the lift gate itself. So still a bit of road grime. Honestly, it's not that bad. I could clean that if I was really determined to. I'd probably just leave it alone because it's not like I really care too much. Well, I mean, I do, but... It's not really something that people are gonna notice. And take a quick trip in the back seat. Yeah, all the upholstery is in pretty good shape for the mileage. Again, uh, I don't even think I said it yet. Uh, 81,000 miles is what I picked up this car at. It's now sitting about 81,200, just because I put on all, a lot of those miles driving home. Interestingly, this does have a household style power outlet in the back. I didn't think the SEs had this, but apparently this one does. I don't know if it was some option that you could have gotten. You can see where they went all plumb crazy, the freaking armor all on all this stuff. Cause it makes everything look obnoxiously glossy. But I suppose real quick, I'll pop open the hood. We'll take a peek underneath. I'll show you all around. So there it'd be the two liter EcoBoost turbo four cylinder with its plastic beauty cover and everything. Again, to reiterate, for those who are curious about the horsepower figures, it's about 240 horsepower and 270 foot pounds of torque. So for a little compact crossover like this, that's some pretty good numbers. And this thing is definitely no slouch as far as getting up and rolling. Like, and it's not no sports car, but it's surprisingly quick at least comparative to the 1.6 in that escape there, which is by all means not a bad engine, but it's fine. It's not like it's amazing. It's probably more geared towards fuel economy anyway, compared to this one. As far as the fuel economy for this engine anyway, it gets 
22 estimated miles per gallon in the city and 30 miles per gallon on the highway and average between mixed and city is somewhere around 25 26 in my driving which is really not bad i mean certainly a lot better than that thing which is on straight highway driving about 19 miles a gallon <laughs> so uh, over time it's definitely going to save me quite a bit as far as uh, gas is concerned but yeah 2013 model year with a two liter engine now as far as the fuel goes i'm currently running a complimentary tank of regular through this although i'm probably going to run a different type of octane and you can see there's just pine needles everywhere so i might have to come out here and just blow those out slightly annoying that they didn't even tackle this much thanks detail but whatever i mean it's not like it's that big of a deal it's not like the car doesn't run or anything but in any case so yeah that be the engine i guess for funsies oh I just noticed that bug there. Hmm, that's nice. But yeah, anyways, I guess for funsies, let's go ahead and give this thing a quick start and then we'll let it run. It's because, why not? Gotta put the key in the ignition like a pleb. If I can find the key slot, goodness. I'm gonna have to get used to this thing having a weird key positioning. pretty quiet no unusual funny noises coming out of the engine sounds pretty good sounds really good we could probably give it a little rev nothing crazy but just a little rev Yeah, it sounds really healthy. So I cannot be any happier with this thing. It should last quite a while in comparison. I mean, I shouldn't judge the truck. Something probably went bad with it. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, you can just hear. It's a little, little quiet, ticking little engine. A little turbo four cylinder. Yeah, I was hoping that I was gonna get something more aligned like a grandpa car, like a Taurus or something. My brother's lot had one when I was searching, but it was already sold by the time that I had gotten to it, which was unfortunate because it had the 3.5 liter EcoBoost in it. But I took this one anyway, even if it was in stock, because it has all wheel drive. That's a feature I really care about more so than having about 400 horsepower under the hood and only having front wheel drive, because that would cause some pretty massive torque steer, if you know what I mean. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that it's bad, but, you know, it's just a thing with front-wheel drive engines, uh, engine drivetrains. There we go. That's the term I'm looking for. Someone's probably going to come attacking me in the comments section, so woo. You know I'm not a mechanic. I told you that, so I prefaced you. In any case, but yeah, I really am happy. Could not be any happier with this. This is going to definitely suit my needs very well because I, I was like i wasn't really too picky about what car i was gonna get just as long as it had all-wheel drive but most of the time you're gonna find that in crossovers like this you know the escape the honda crv the toyota rav4 and other competitors but this just happened to be the right car at the right place at the right price and yeah it just it could have it couldn't have worked out any better in my opinion so I just wanted to, at least if my brother's watching this, he probably is. I wanted to give him a big thank you for helping out with the purchase and helping me get through all the paperwork remotely and being able to uh, come pick me up so we could seal the deal and get this thing rolling. I am thoroughly ecstatic and the drive home was very comfortable and so should the future drives to work. Like I honestly am really happy with this thing. So we'll go ahead and we'll get this thing sealed back up and then i got a couple other things to talk about and then i suppose we will get on to testing those computers i mentioned which i kind of teased you about just a little while ago so jump cut so a couple things that i wanted to talk about just because well i might as well get them out of the way mainly being video scheduling and probably topics i suppose and in addition i also wanted to bring up the possibility of a patreon 
little thing that I'm going to add to the channel. If that or a YouTube membership, I haven't decided yet. So I'll get onto that here later. Anyways, as far as the video stuff is concerned, I've been a little bit slacking on that. Just mainly because I was taking the time to focus at work while I was trying to deal with the, you know, the car situation and just trying to stay caught up in my daily work because that's a pretty important thing to do. But mainly the reasons why some videos went out faster than others and the activity was a bit mixed is mainly just down to my motivation in making videos. I was mostly taking time in the evenings to play games with some friends in my Discord server, which I have. And there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, I'd rather take my own personal life over YouTube, you know, as far as mental health concerns are concerned, to lack of a better word. And I'm sure that most people would agree that's probably where I should ultimately be focusing is on my personal health since, you know, it is obviously a full-time job and I drive about three hours round trip accumulated time together. You know, every day minimum, I'm looking at around 140 miles that's accumulating the drive up to work and the drive back home. I would estimate it's around 140 miles at a minimum. So it's a lot of driving and it's a lot of stress and it really exhausts me quite a bit. So the motivation to make videos is very slim. Usually I only save the recording for the weekends unless I get something special in or I have something already in mind to wanna to make a video about. And it's just been a little slow lately. I just I haven't had the motivation to want to do stuff like that, mainly again because of the car and mainly because I've had another video project in the works that's been taking a little bit of time to get through, hoping to get it done eventually. Uh, it's just gonna take me an extra while longer just to compile data just because I haven't used the machine in a week because I was dealing with my car situation. You know, it all goes back to that thing because I just, you know, personal life issues like that come before YouTube. That's just how it's gonna go. So hopefully with that laptop video coming out eventually, I'm gonna bring it with me and I'm gonna finish hopefully working on some of the compilation of data and such. That should be out sometime next week. That's the cross my fingers plan. It's not gonna be like some critical crazy review. It's mostly just gonna be rambling, showing off benchmarks and just kind of talking about my thoughts on this particular product. And I mean, it, you could be, you could consider it a review, but I'm, I'm just gonna gloss over some of the aspects of the machine itself that I'm using for testing. I'm not gonna make it some serious review video sort of thing. I'll obviously add a narration, but it's not gonna be some formal review if you know what I mean. All right, jump cut. I had to speak with my grandmother. Anyways, so as far as the video scheduling is concerned, uh, not necessarily about the topics per se, but as far as the scheduling goes, uh, still probably gonna do the usual no fixed schedule at the moment because, well, one day of work can vary to the next and I can't make a guaranteed commitment that I'm going to always be uploading a video every week because that might just not happen. You know, it's impossible for me to judge what's gonna happen as far as my work schedule is concerned. And I hope that makes sense to people watching because I don't wanna to have to repeat myself or have to deal with a bunch of not very intelligent people who don't watch these videos all the way through to the end and then they post comments assuming things and then they get corrected like idiots in the comment section and it becomes a whole comment section war. So I'd rather not have that happen if possible. So hopefully it comes out all right enough, maybe. So in any case, that puts me to the next topic, which is gonna be regarding some kind of further membership, whether it be Patreon or a YouTube membership of some sort. I'm not sure what pathway I wanna take as far as this is concerned. And you might be asking yourself why I'm even doing it in the first place, and that's a great question, since obviously that's the relevant topic here. Basically, we've had problems in my Discord server for at least a couple of years now. It's slowed down a little bit, but the gist of it is we've had problems with people who annoyingly will join my server with erratic usernames, intentionally trying to bully people or bully me or to just post spam in my new user log. It's absolutely disgusting. It's really threatening and it unsettles a lot of people, including my moderators. And I had to hide it like the new user log away from most everybody. So only I and my moderators and my server could see it. And even still, it's absolutely disgusting what kind of activity has gone on inside of there. Truly racial and other kinds of stuff I'm not even gonna get into. So to put it this way, 
we have decided that, or not necessarily like we as a group, like my moderators on my Discord server, but I've come to the personal conclusion that I have to do something regarding my Discord server going forward since my channel is only going to continue to grow in size. And I feel like the proper way to go about it is to prevent the general public from seeing the invite link to my server. I know that's gonna probably cause some kind of rile up. Some people understand it, some people won't. I know for a fact that this is going to not only consolidate the people that are inside of my Discord server, but it's also going to prevent the kind of growth of users that I would expect inside of my Discord server. And this is to be expected just because of the nature of putting something like that behind a paywall. And what that means is that there's extra security regarding people joining my server. There are gonna be actual trusted people who are going to be putting down real money to join my server. And this is just an attempt to ease off these ban evading people. I'm not sure if it's the same person or if multiple people are doing it. We haven't had problems with it in a while and I don't want to jinx myself, but basically I just, whether, it doesn't matter when it happens really, and it doesn't matter who's doing it. The point is it's still extremely annoying and I just rather not deal with it. And my moderators don't want to deal with it because we've flat out had enough. We've had enough targeted assaults, well not assaults, but targeted bullying and there's a lot of racialness going into it. And needless to say, to put it this way, even though I know I'm gonna have to blurp this out later, a lot of Photoshop dicks on people. Yes, that's the kind of level that we're at. And then we've got things from like, I'm not even gonna bring it up. It's it's truly nasty. I, I can just put things in picture in picture to kind of describe to you the amount of disgustingness that we as a moderator group and myself have had to look at and you can see for yourself why I've decided to make the decision that I'm wanting to make. It's not final by any stretch of the means. I have not implemented any solution yet to make this link hidden behind a paywall. That's where I'm stuck. I'm just, I'm deciding on what method I want to go about, I guess implementing is the word, not really the best thing to use, but I digress anyways. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of little crowdfunding campaign sites that you can utilize, Patreon being obviously a well-recognized one. And the perk of that being that it has its own different tiers and it has uh, its own platform where you can put your own unique content or you can just link stuff from YouTube. And the perk of that being that if something goes wrong with YouTube, then you're still gonna get your Patreon stuff under the assumption that Patreon doesn't go down with the whole YouTube crash or whatever the case might be. The con of that is that it's another website to manage everything individually, including the tiers, the logos, the descriptions, and managing the users. It just becomes a pain in the butt because the problem is you don't know if someone who's gonna be supporting your campaign on Patreon is an actual verified YouTube subscriber to your channel. Not like that means too much for relevancy's sake, but I would suppose if you're gonna be contributing to a Patreon campaign, you might as well subscribe to the person's channel. It only just makes sense, you know, if you think about it objectively. And I just don't want the extreme hassle of having to manage stuff like that unless I absolutely have to. If it gives me more flexibility, if it gives me more features, then sure, I might consider it. But at the same time, if there's gonna be more hassle around trying to implement it, then I don't know, maybe I'll have to decide that stuff later. But I do think that it would be a sensible idea to try Patreon out because then I could put some very inexpensive tiers into a little campaign page that you can look at. And I'm not really gonna ask for much at all because let's be fair, my channel is very small. My target demographic, as far as my content is concerned, is very limited. You know, we're mostly centered around computers and other general technology as a whole. And so obviously it's a popular segment. It's definitely a popular niche as far as YouTube content is concerned. And I do think that it could work out if deployed correctly. And like I said, I wouldn't ask for very much at all. Like very little amounts of money. Probably the most expensive tier like would be 10 bucks or under. I wouldn't ask for much at all. And I don't even know if I'd go that high even. So 
the reason why I just thought I bring this up is just to secure my Discord server, and perhaps maybe I could deliver some extra perks along the way. Maybe you could see some exclusive behind the scenes videos. You could even see exclusive vlogs if you really wanted to. I could make those. And it just gives you another avenue to which you can watch content from me and to be able to interact with me regarding video ideas, suggestions, or some other feedback. Because of course, YouTube, does have that ability, but some things do get lost in the sea. I mean, obviously I don't have a heck of a lot of comments coming in, so I see everything, but who's to say going in the future if that's still gonna be the same? You just don't know. And obviously, of course, if I make a popular video, then who knows if the stuff is gonna get lost. I know that, you know, Google has search implementations, but YouTube's not perfect. And mind you, stuff still does get censored behind those stupid uh, held for review sections in the comment section and so on and so forth. So that's an option I was thinking about was just going about Patreon just because of being its own independent platform. But I was also considering YouTube because the thing with YouTube is that you have a easier time figuring out who's actually pitching into your membership. And uh, you can add custom emojis to YouTube live stream chats and you can deliver perks like I think there's like boosted comments or, you know, you can post exclusive things in your community feed to only show up to members and so on and so forth. <laughs> Jump cut again, got interrupted because of course. So the thing with YouTube, I'm not sure if you can actually have multiple tiers as far as like exclusivity. So you could put behind one tier, you could have well, the Discord link, and you'd have the ability to have access to emojis and exclusive community post links. And then maybe there could be access to uh, unlisted content that I could put out to people and they could watch it exclusively. I'm not sure what kind of options there would be. I haven't looked into it myself to see what the advantages and disadvantages would be. So the thought is here. It's just the execution. I'm not sure exactly how I want to go about it. But I do know that it's something I would want to implement because number one, it would allow my Discord server more security and actual people who want to join can still join. But unfortunately, that just means you have to probably put up a little bit of money. Now, I do want to make this a bit of a heads up. It's not going to be an exclusive behind a paywall thing going forward. But what that just means is that it's going to be primarily behind a paywall because I don't want the invite link anymore to be used as a bit of a free-for-all for people to just randomly join with very explicit usernames and flooding my new user log and it makes it very difficult to manage the users and it also puts a lot of stress on not just me but also the moderators of my server and i really don't want to have to put them any more under any more stress than they have to it's almost like they have a life too outside of discord and their computer and it's just one of those things i don't really want to add a bot to manage banavators because you don't even know if the person that's gonna be joining is a banavator in the first place. You just don't know. And it's really difficult to program something that only bans accounts that have like those generic profile pictures on them, like the generic little Discord logo, because who knows, maybe even a legit person could join with a generic profile picture and you wouldn't know if it was a banavator or not because it would just ban it. And how fair would that be? I mean, it's not fair to the system we've got going right now where we ban people that don't have profile pictures or a sensible username or social links or a bio or a banner or whatever. So it's it's just tough to manage. And so I'd rather it be that if this kid decides he wants to continue to ban evade inside of my Discord server, then he's going to have to cough up the money because he's going to find out the hard way that stuff like that ain't going to fly anymore. And it's going to start costing him money and which in turn is going to go into helping to pay my campaign seems sensible right well i mean in theory that's the idea and i could tell if he joins because then i could revoke the link and remake it and then he no longer has access to abuse it and what that means is that if he wants access to it again he's gonna have to make a whole nother account and he's gonna have to pay money again and he's gonna have to make his stunt again so i bet you he probably doesn't have very deep pockets if at all and He's expecting that his VPNs are gonna save him. Uh-uh, nope, Discord I think has kicked in with that because I found, and this is not 100% legit if this is true or not, if Discord silently implemented this, but I think if you use the browser version of Discord with a VPN and you don't associate an account with an email address when you join, 
Well, the problem is I think Discord actually pops up like a two-factor authentication prompt because they think something's really fishy going on. And I don't know if that's been directly caused by me sending in reports of this type of attack from my server and they're actually finally doing something about it silently in the background. I better hope that this is the case because I've not really seen a lot of ban evading activity lately. And I think it's because, number one, I don't know if they've just given up, which I doubt it. Or number two, maybe there's some additional security going in. Because the thing with Discord is, and this has always been the case with the platform ever since I've been using it in late 2017, is that there is no security in the web browser version from people making accounts with whatever username they feel and not associating it with an email address that logs who this person is that's making this account with this username so that way they can't go back and sit here and flood people's Discord servers with these stupid one-time use accounts that aren't associated with anything. How are you gonna log this activity? How are you gonna track people? Well, not literally in the sense that, you know, Facebook tracking, but how are you gonna track people with a support ticket of the of the of these per well, I shouldn't say persons because that's really the wrong word, but these accounts that are joining my server or anybody else's server for that matter, and then they just leave because the username is so absolutely crazy. Why are these usernames even being allowed in the first place? How do you allow something like with swastikas to get past the username check? Like what the crap? How do you allow this? How do you allow n words? How do you allow other swear words? Why do you allow these? awful profile pictures in the first place. Well, what is wrong with you, staff? That's ridiculous. And I hope that somebody was listening and they did something. I don't know, because like I said, I can't assume. I can only like make some kind of uh, educated guess because of what I've seen. But it just, I don't know. I'm just, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of playing these games. My life's too short. And right now I've just not got the time and the ability to want to devote to having to sit here and babysit my new user log in my Discord server, which luckily I haven't had to do recently. But it's not to say it wouldn't happen in the future. And it's one of those activities that really has told me a lot about leaving a public chat invite link for people to just flood with unnecessary crap. So I don't know. I'll probably make a future update video as far as that's concerned, explaining whatever little external membership stuff is concerned and just explain everything, how it's going to work. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to have a couple of friends look over some things with me and we're just going to see uh, what stuff is like. Like I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to go with the YouTube membership or if I'm going to go with Patreon. I haven't decided exactly what pathway I'm taking on that, but whatever I pick, I know for a fact that the main Discord link is going to be removed from my channel. And I don't know if I ever finished this thought about the, the fact that it's not always gonna be behind a paywall. And the reason why I bring that up is because I, I might do live streams every once in a while. And with that, I might actually post a special invite link that's time sensitive. Like obviously, of course, when the stream is over, I'm gonna kill the link, but it will have unlimited uses. And so you could probably join the server that way. And that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And the reason why I would say that in particular is just because I just, I hate putting things like that behind a paywall because the people like you watching this video really don't deserve to have to go through that necessarily unless there's exclusive perks for people who are actually paying for that. And I do intend to actually give those paying people some exclusivity. So some exclusive chat rooms and voice chats. And like I said, some of those other perks that I'm probably gonna implement. And that way for people who joined through this campaign and I know that they're paying, which we'll see how that management goes. I'll have to figure that out, but I digress. Um, they're gonna get some extra perks, which is pretty cool. And so in that case, I, I don't know. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll make a future video on it and we'll go from there. So that's about all I got to say for that. So I guess we'll wrap up this video by checking out those computers I mentioned, cause uh, re. All right, let's head back out here to the car and we'll pull them out. So I got two desktops and three laptops. Although I might only be able to test two of the laptops for obvious reasons, as you'll soon see. This is a pretty gross Acer Aspire from about 2007 with a 
kind of an interesting HP flat panel display here. And we also have an HP Pavilion computer. This is specifically the HP Pavilion A747C, which I believe is socket 775 Intel. And I'll probably have to confirm that, but I believe that's the case. As far as laptops go, nothing crazy. I think it's a HP NX6000 that this one in particular is. Um, I don't know, I have to look here. Yeah, NX5000, okay. As you can clearly see, the display on this is busted and that's unfortunate, but I don't know, for all it's worth, this thing might probably be dead either way. So it's not like it's that huge of a loss to me. I think these things were Pentium M's, but they had discrete GPUs. I'm not entirely sure. This might have like some kind of Radeon 9000 series chip in it, like a 9200 or maybe it has a 9600, I don't know. I would assume probably not because there's no stickers to tell and there's just a very small heatsink. But as far as the other laptops go, we have two Dell Latitude D610s, both of which are extremely dirty. This one more so than the other. And this one is missing a key on the keyboard, unfortunately. It's missing the, I think, yeah, I is the key that's missing. But none of the displays seem to be busted. Now, whether or not they work is another thing entirely. But at least the screens are not broken. So really, I guess anything goes. We'll have to see if they do anything. I suppose we'll get the laptops out of the way. And we'll check out the desktops because I got to make some space for the desktops. Probably foreshadowing what's about to happen with at least this Acer. <laughs> it's got a TNT sticker on it. All right. So here it be. It's got the original spec label on the front of it. It's got uh, AST180-UA381B designed for Windows Vista Home Basic with the matching COA on the side of the case. Athlon 64 3800 Plus, that's a pretty strong single core chip, but still a single core, so I can see why it was designed for Vista Basic. One gig of RAM, 160 gig hard drive, which I think is actually still in there. I haven't opened up the case of this one yet to find that out, but I think it still does. I know for a fact this has a hard drive in it still, the A747C. And this one is a very similar I.O. layout to my A250N, except it doesn't have the floppy drive. But this one also has an additional DVD-ROM drive, as well as the DVD-RW drive. And it actually supports dual-layer discs. That's nice. Uh, Firewire, USB 2, and audio jacks, and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and crack into these things. I'm actually curious about the Acer to see what it has. Because like I said, I haven't even cracked into the Acer yet. I've, I've seen inside the HP... It's got, I think, an Asus motherboard. So for all I know, it's probably dead. I need a screwdriver. Screwdriver acquired. And I also got a battery backup because my phone was at 1%. And I was about to die. So, oops. <laughs> That's what I get for recording too long and not paying attention. All right. Let's crack open these screws here. I have a very similar model to this. If you remember from a previous video, the exact same case design. It's just the other model was Athlon 64 X2 powered. Whereas this is a single core Athlon 64. So I would probably assume the motherboard is going to be very similar, but who's to say? All right, well, the latch moves at least. So, oh, let's probably take a couple hands. Wow, it's kind of tight. Yeah, it is. Holy crap. I almost barely wasn't able to get it off. Oh, 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 oh. yes, please. Look at that original patina. Oh my God. <laughs> Look at the heat sink. <laughs> wow. Wow. If this thing actually still works, I'll be impressed. Oh my God. It's like no one ever cleaned this thing. That's unbelievable. Well, it is believable because this is our area, but wow. FSP group power supply, about 250 watts by the look of the model number label there. Hard drive is a Hitachi. Uh, I don't know what the capacity is. I'm going to assume it's 160 gigabyte because that's got the Acer sticker on it still. Really? IDE optical drive. They're still doing that with these. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I think this does have the same motherboard. MCP61SM-AM revision 1. I think this is the same motherboard. Hang on. Let me go grab that computer real quick. Yeah, would you look at that? This is my Athlon 64 X2 unit. And yeah, sure enough, 
MCP61SM-AM revision 1. So they use the same motherboard. Well, ain't that cool? It's just uh, this one's an X2, so it's got a bigger heatsink. But yeah, still, that's awesome. Well, and this one has a Seagate hard drive, so it's objectively better because it's 250 gigabyte. But I digress. Anyway, yeah, really looking forward to seeing what this thing has on it. So we'll have to clean it out first because that heatsink is just ugh, gross. Not like this one's much more better, I guess, in a sense. Um, I still got to put a screw into this video card. Oops. But in any case, um, yeah, I'd be very interested to try this Vista Home Basic meme out and see if it turns on, comparatively speaking to the Home Premium machine on top of it. Anyways, let's see what's in the HP. Already off to a great start in here. We've got a big old cobweb in the way. <laughs> wow, it's got a Beefy high pro power supply. I was not expecting that. It's actually the original 305 watt, maybe, maybe 300 watts. It says right there on the label. I don't know. It depends. Um, it's definitely been outside for a while. That's the spider webs. And they probably had a video card in this thing at some point, hence the missing slot cover blank. So somebody probably had the video card equipped in this thing, either that or it would have shipped with one new. I actually don't know. Um, hard drive wise, it looks like. The original 160 gig hard drive is in this thing. That's what these things came with was a 160 gigabyte. Looks like it's actually SATA too. It's pretty nice. Dual optical drives. And yeah, as you can see, I have a suspicion that this one is socket 775 if I straighten the camera here. Because that mounting bracket looks like LGA 775 to me. It's got that style of beefy cooler on it when Intel was still doing that. The only unfortunate thing is this is a capacitor plague victim and... While all the caps by the CPU socket are solid, the ones that are electrolytic, there's a couple that are bulging their tops right over there. And in fact, actually right over here by the RAM slot, I just, well, you're not really able to see it because the spider rub's in the way. But right in there, there's another one that's got a bloating top. So that's unfortunate. Um, I guess if this thing still works, and I would have a fairly strong suspicion that it probably does, even though it's got an Asus motherboard, Perhaps, maybe, it might be worth pulling the board out and recapping it because these Socket 775 systems, they really cross that gap between completely obsolete and at least somewhat still usable for certain projects. And if this one actually still works, it could go pretty well alongside my A250N, which is Socket 478. So we'll have to see because my, my uh, A250N does not suffer from capacitor plague, either that or it was repaired. So this one could be a worthwhile machine to fix up. I actually don't know. Also, this thing has really gotten dusty over the time of sitting in my trailer. I just looked at it. And I cleaned this thing too. Well, not the best, but I'll do the same thing with this one because both of these are just gross. Anyways, I'm rambling. So how about we test out these laptops and then we'll test out these desktops. Sounds exciting. Almost forgot to mention with these desktops, I do have a monitor to test with them. This HP Pavilion F50 flat panel display. Looks like we also have another mouse and keyboard. <laughs> Some kind of HP CDRW. Man, that would have been an expensive disc. I don't know. The rest of the price is probably not visible or something like that. I can't really read it. But either way, it uh, looks like we have a Microsoft keyboard. Yeah, sure enough, we do. This looks like a PS2 keyboard. Honestly, even throughout all of the grime, it's really not all that shiny. And Microsoft keyboards, assuming that they're not dirty in this state, well, yeah, H, that's the perfect key to get stuck down. Um, generally, they type really well. Microsoft used a pretty good enough rubber dome that they're not terrible feeling. They actually are pretty decent. Although, probably not gonna use this because it needs a good cleaning. And I probably won't use these speakers either. You know, they are original HP speakers, but some dimwit that decided to put this in the box left them connected, and oops, I think it broke. Oh well, that sucks. At least they do have power cables to plug in both the computer and the monitor. It looks like it's a 15-inch LCD, probably 1024 by 768 resolution, so I'm going to have to dig that out, and we'll use that to test both the Home Basic meme and the HP meme, so E. Okay, time to see if this one starts up. Oh my gosh, this is going to be bad if it doesn't. Look at the rubber on the monitor. <laughs> Ew, this thing is gross. 
Oh my gosh. This is just mostly going to be for curiosity factor. I don't even know if I even want to do anything with this. Power's in. Oh no. <laughs> it still sees that it's got a, a charge at least. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> Actually turns on. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. That is crazy. All right. This, this keyboard's gross. 1.6 gigahertz Pentium M with one gig of dual channel RAM. Oh, uh, dang. This one only has the Intel graphics. Well, that basically means it's worthless. Well, that sucks, but yeah, it's got a 40 gigabyte hard drive at least. So that's cool, I guess. Uh, it's got Intel wireless too. I might be able to salvage that for something else. Says the battery is taking a charge. Uh, that's interesting. Okay. I might actually leave this on the charger then if that's the case hmm well in any case um yeah cmos battery's dead but let's uh let's see if this thing boots into its operating system if it even has one let's let's find out well it's definitely got windows xp still on the hard drive okay that makes sense i legitimately wonder where this was used because man this thing is gross it is so gross like, these rubber feet have effectively already disintegrated, and this machine's not even that old. Oh my god. Nasty. Alright, well, came up with a user account of Spanky. Um. Ah, uh, okay. That's nice, I guess. I like winky face. <laughs> Alrighty. And I don't know, is this running... It's running professional. It's got user. Does the admin account have a password on it? I guess we'll find out. Whoops, if I can learn to type today, maybe. Oh, it does. <laughs> it does. All right, let me point the camera away. See if anything comes up on the screen. That's not very safe for work. All right, well, we're off to a great start. Um, something is going on with the display driver. Oh, there it goes. Unable to find a version of the runtime to run this application. .NET Framework Initialization Error. So, somebody got a Smart Media Converter. Nice. Um, found new hardware wizard for the modem. And something else. Okay, what is this then? Multimedia Audio Controller. Oh, brilliant. So, they don't even have a sound driver installed. And... We have Windows Genuine Advantage coming up because, of course, we do. I wonder if this is actually a legitimate copy of Windows because I would almost bet you it's not. All right. Well, I guess it actually is a legit copy. Hmm. Alrighty then, either that or the service is just rigged. Alright, um, let's see, my computer properties. This does have a Dothan Pentium M at 1.6 gigahertz with one gigabyte of RAM. Very nice. I don't think there's probably anything left on this machine as far as data is concerned, but I don't want to assume. Let's see. Yeah, there's not much on the hard drive at all, at least based on that number. Updates are ready for your computer. <laughs> what are these? Uh, obviously, these are probably already pre-cached. Oh, yeah. Windows malicious software. They were using this thing in 2014? Oh, my God. Seriously? I mean, I guess it's not out of the question. Shut up. I don't care. I'm not connecting to Wi-Fi network right now. Um, well, other than the smart media converter, what else is on this thing? Um... Looks like they ran Windows Update, and they got some of the stuff. They got Silverlight. Brilliant. Driver Genius Professional Edition. That's definitely not some bloatware. Neither is the Smart Media Converter, but I digress. Um, and I don't know what kind of interactual stuff, interactual player. Clearly, somebody reinstalled Windows on this thing and did a pretty poor job. So that does not surprise me, given the people that live around here. Or whoever was working on it last. So, at least we have one win. We'll see if we have two wins. Alright, now I've got the cleaner of the two. Let's see if this one does anything. Alright. 
This one's got the latest BIOS revision. It's also got Intel wireless by the looks of it. Let's see, press F2. This one has a 1.73 gigahertz Pentium M, one gig of RAM. Ooh, this one's got an ATI card in it, okay. Only a 1024 by 768 display, but hey, it's still got the ATI graphics card. That's interesting. Okay, okay. 60 gigabyte hard drive. Battery thinks it's taking a charge. This one says the battery's performing normally. All right. Well, maybe you might be onto something here. Let's see if she starts up into an operating system. Oh, no. A disk read error occurred. Dang it. Well, that sucks. Probably means there's no operating system. Probably. Just assuming. All right. It's time for some duster can action brought to you in part by absolutely nobody other than the person that's behind the camera. Not soon to be in front of the camera. I don't know. Hmm. We might need stronger elements of force. <laughs> I think that did it. I'm gonna get it back. Well, hope the CPU can breathe now. Should be able to. All right, well, I got the monitor ready to go, except for, well, we need the power cable. So smoke test time, I guess. I don't know if I can get the power cord plugged in in the first place. Okay. Beauty. That's what I want to see. Yeah, let's get this stuff hooked up and let's try this stuff out. All right, first things first, I'm gonna test out this H. So, got the power cord ready to go. Let's make sure it doesn't blow up here or something. At least as far as initial impressions go, no explosions. I'm gonna take this off the LCD as well. I'll have to clean that panel up later. Hopefully it's in good enough shape. Ooh, that CPU fan sounds great. But it posts. Is that the CPU fan doing that? Nope. Oh, it's the case fan. Okay, well luckily I know what that is then. That'll be an easy fix. I can just replace that fan if I need to. So 512 megabytes of RAM, that was the original specification. It's got 160 gig hard drive, dual optical drives, shut up fan. That's some good bearings. Pentium 4, 2.8 gigahertz at 800 megahertz front side bus. I think that is the Pentium 4 520, if I'm not mistaken. God, that fan is super annoying. Yeah, I'm just gonna plug that. I think it's that one. That fan sounds delicious. I'm gonna just unplug it and I'll just deal with the fan failure header thing in a minute. Uh, it's the onboard video, because this is probably Intel 915 or something like that, I would probably bet. Let's see, how's the temperature of the processor? Eh, not great. It's fine, it's not great. Uh, probably typical for a Pentium 4 anyway. Uh, Hyperthreading is enabled. Yeah, at least the CPU fan's good. That's good. So let's see what's on this thing's hard drive. Surprisingly, I didn't get a fan failure message. Okay, so we do have an operating system that pops up at least. It says recovery console as well. well let's see if she starts up. You can definitely hear that sucker. Definitely a loud spindle on that sucker. Yeah, 
Okay. We got HP underscore owner. So that's a telltale sign that this may have the original operating system load. Oh, brother. That's going to be interesting. Um, hmm, okay. Do we have a password? Yes, we do. Okay. Well, let me run auto. I want to just check out this panel real quick. Yeah, this panel is in excellent shape. I don't see any press marks or any discoloration, no weird pixels. This is an excellent condition panel. Good even backlighting. It's gonna probably look even better when I clean it up. Holy crap, that's nice. I'm obviously gonna be paying the thrift store owner for some of this stuff, because obviously some of it's pretty good. At least this thing actually seems to work fine, even despite the bulging capacitors. Let's grab a mouse and let's plug it in here. I'm gonna give it a minute. Oh, I already have a mouse already. Nice. <laughs> password hint. No. <laughs> We've got the best password hints. No wonder people get locked out of their accounts. Yeah, I wonder why. Let's see. Does the admin account have a password on it? Let's find out. Oops, if I can learn to spell the administrator account properly, maybe that would help. I'm able to log in because of an account restriction now. Probably because they disabled it. All right, well... There goes the fun in that. Um, let's go try out the recovery and let's see if that starts up because it might. Could be interesting anyway. What I might just do if I'm really concerned about the install of Windows on this thing, which I don't know, I might be. I'll hack the uh, sticky keys thing with the command prompt and then I'll just go about it that way. Oh my God, it still exists on this thing's hard drive. You're kidding me. Dear God. <laughs> of course. Of course it still has the HP recovery on it. It seems to work. Copyright 2004. Hey, hey. Well, well, we'll see if we can maybe save that for another video. That could be interesting. All right. Let's move on to the Acer. I'm going to make sure to plug that fan back in even though it sucks. All right, it is the Aspire's turn to get electrified, hopefully in a functional way. Although, I don't know, that power supply is still kind of gross. Well, waste not, want not. Oof. One long beep code, hmm. Also, the CPU fan's not spinning. That's a great start. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's time to troubleshoot and see what's going on. Well, reseating the RAM did it. <laughs> that was the same fix as my other one. Literally had to reseat the RAM on the Athlon 64X2 unit and it came right back to life. Well, that was easy. All right. BIOS release date, February 7th, 2007. And it's the Aspire T180 with a ridiculously long serial number, but whatever's. CPU is currently sitting at 11 degrees, although that might look deceiving, but that's actually something of a noteworthy point because these Athlon 64 single cores are not really designed to run past a certain threshold of 60 degrees Celsius. So this is actually a pretty good idle temperature for one of these. Obviously the CMOS battery is dead. It's got a configuration of one gig of RAM and everything else I suppose is okay for now. So let's just go ahead and well, actually at least I could do is set the date and time. I didn't do that with the HP. Today is the 29th of August, 2021. It's trying to start up. Oh, it's still got Windows Vista on it. Oh, dear. <laughs> nice. Brilliant. Well, either this thing is in the wrong resolution or it was used with a different monitor and this HP monitor ended up going with that well, HP computer over there, which is probably more likely. So the text looks all kinds of goofy. Let's see. Do we have a password hint? I would. Uh, no, we don't. Okay, we do have a guest user, so... I guess I could hop on there real quick and check stuff out for all the good that that will do. Let's see how slow this thing is to log in. Surprisingly, Vista 
despite the weird resolution, looks really good on this LCD. Like, I'll give it to these older LCDs. They just have a better looking image for the time period operating systems like this. I don't know. XP would obviously be more appropriate, but Vista does not look bad. This panel's got some really good color for what it is, of course. Let's see. Oh, it definitely was used for a bunch of games, and it's definitely the original Acer install because we've got the Esobi V2, Acer Tour. They were definitely using this for certain games like Ghost Recon. I'm sure that went well. And I guess they were on Ubisoft.com or something. Uh, Sudoku, Mahjong, Buku Kakuro. Don't know what that is. And we've obviously got emoticons for your messenger. Very useful. Let's see here. Let's open up Task Manager, because why not? Oh, they left DWM enabled, so there we go. That'll definitely not true through the RAM. We've got the Welcome Center coming up, which we don't need to. Really, a jack has been unplugged. You don't say. Oh, what's it trying to install? Windows Live Messenger, oh dear God. <laughs> wow, this thing's definitely a blast from the past. NVIDIA GeForce 6100 integrated graphics. It's stealing 256 megs of the system RAM for video, so it's got 768 megs to run Vista. An unexpected error occurred to the family safely. Access is denied. Well, dang, I guess it's because I'm logged in as the guest user. Here, let me get the screen resolution fixed and whatnot. <laughs> Thanks. Man, what the heck kind of resolution is 960 by 600? It's like some kind of ultra-wide resolution. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do necessarily. Yeah, that's better. I can actually like somewhat discern the text properly. And we are allowed to see the system properties, I guess, kind of. Would you like HP update to check for software updates? No. Also, it sounds like there's a CD in the drive. There is. It's just some kind of Psygnosis microcosm game. Hmm. Copyright 1994. Manufactured in Austria. Hmm. Interesting. Also, it doesn't look like we get the exact specs, but we're running RTM Windows Vista Home Basics, so that's definitely something we had a power user. Windows is activated, obviously, because it's OEM. I'm not verifying that. Uh, let's see. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, it's going to make me have admin rights to even launch the device manager. Well, crap. I guess we're going to have to... Uh, can we even launch command prompt? Will it let me do that? Oh, it does. Okay. Um, just let me run net user. It does actually let me run net user. Okay. Maybe I'll try to unlock that user account for what it's worth. I think it's a Darren user probably. Give me a moment. Let me see if I can crack this. So if I look in here, you can see there's an Acer e-recovery management. And of course, I can't run this while I'm under the guest account, but that's a thonk. That'll be interesting to try running on this. Uh, it's got Office, probably XP, I think is what's on this. Let's try running something. Oh, Word 2000. Okay, I just overestimated the version there, but looks like we've got Word 2000 with no updates. Uh, let's see what other things are on here. I can't imagine that there's probably much good uh, user guide, Windows utilities, woo, calculator. So yeah, nothing really all that fancy. It does have security essentials for all the good that that does because, well, you haven't run a scan on your computer. Last scan, March 17th, 2014. That was probably the last time this thing was running and they probably never used it that much. Hence why it never got any service packs because nobody knows how software updates work. And they probably thought their computer was out of support because they didn't install the service packs. Big brain moment. Hmm. They only used Internet Explorer. It was probably stuck on Internet Explorer 7. And then they wondered why their sites wouldn't work. Hmm. Big brain moment. So, yeah. Um, we'll have to restore this one as well. I'll have to see how we can do that. I think you just run it through the Windows utility. And then it starts up the computer into its own special mode. But I think what we might have to do. I'm going to run a restart real quick. And we'll see if perhaps maybe um, there's an option in the recovery prompt for something like that. I don't actually know. And we'll see if the admin account even has a password on it. It probably does, but we'll see. All right, time to be dumb. Because I'm going to see if I can get around this whole dealio bob with the password and net user and, you know, replacing sticky keys with the command prompt. 
So, time to hate myself and use a Windows 10 DVD. Yes, yeah, 64-bit. This is going to go over very well on one gigabyte of RAM, in which 256 megs of it are shared for the video memory. But we like to live dangerously here, so let's try it. It's probably not going to work. Ah, uh, this isn't supposed to work. How is it starting up? <laughs> wow. Okay, I'll actually give that some credit. It actually can boot Windows 10 20H2 setup. So at least this computer is somewhat future-proof if you were to upgrade the RAM. Would you want to? Probably not. Yeah. Exit and continue to Microsoft Windows Vista. <laughs> it actually detects the operating system. That's incredible. All right, command prompt. Let's do this stuff. Uh, first things first, um, where's task manager? I got to see the RAM consumption. 96%! <gasps> Wow. Oh my gosh. It barely fits in RAM. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. There's no RAM uh, page file either, I don't think. That's impressive. Holy crap. 69, nice. Okay, so for those not playing along with what I'm about to try here, so basically, the set hc command is the sticky keys which is triggered when you hit shift on your keyboard five times now all that the system calls for is this file when you do that command five times you know pressing left shift five times it'll call that file so it doesn't matter what the file is necessarily it doesn't care it just matters that the executable name exists so you can rename command prompt as this file and so when we go ahead and exit out of here and then restart into windows vista what we can do is you can trigger sticky keys on the login screen of windows and the trick is you can use that ability to launch command prompt and use the net user command as a system level user because you're not logged into a particular user with restrictions and it'll allow you to reset passwords through that method and that way you don't have to start up a live linux and have to reset a password using a command line utility which you can most certainly do and those are going to be as functional as this as resetting passwords in fact it might even be more powerful but this is kind of an easier way to do it if you have access to a Windows installer disk like I do. Well, even if it's in USB or DVD form, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you'll still have access to the ability to do that. So if I press left shift five times now, well, there it goes. There you go. We now have command prompt named setHC.exe. And now we can go net user and bada boom, bada bing. There we go. Now we can reset the password. All right, now for some good security, I'm just going to reset as password one, two, three, four, and I'm going to assume this is the Darren user. So let's find out if I'm correct. Correct. So now we can log in. Now, this is the part where I definitely gotta turn the camera away because I have no idea what to expect when this thing logs in. So I shall be right back. All right, so it turns out when I logged in, this had somebody else's profile picture set. So, yeah, I had to set that differently. And I also turned off DWM because there's no point in having that enabled and disabled, which broke the welcome center because, of course, it did. Um, they were definitely a power user if they left the Windows welcome center to launch when they logged into the computer. Uh, lots of stuff down here. A360 malware crush. I have no idea what that is. Either way, um, now we can finally verify our specifications. Yeah, there we go. Athlon 64, 3800 plus with 768 megs of available RAM. That's a lot, mind you. And yeah, Windows Experience Index is really good. We don't have Windows Arrow, so I still don't know why they referenced that in there, but it's whatever. Cool. Well, there we go. Now we have access to pretty much whatever we want at this point. Um, there's definitely a lot of personal files probably still on this thing's hard drive. Oh yeah, there definitely is. Um, so I'm not going to show that stuff on camera for the security of the original owner. I'm going to exit out of some of these applications because, uh, clearly some of them don't really need to be running in the background. Oh, and it's lagging too. Where even is the sidebar? I saw the sidebar in there. Why isn't that up front? Oh, probably because nobody decided to throw gadgets on there. Well, I mean, I guess that makes sense. 
What even do we have? Oh, it's just the generic Windows ones. Okay. Whatever. Ooh, what's this? Facebook update.exe. Ooh. Facebook installer. Nice. One of the other garbage is running on this thing at the moment. Oh, yeah, the command prompt's running in the background. Let's probably close that. Oh, access is denied. Oh, wow, really? Wonder why it's running in the background. Anyways. So, yeah, that gets me to this thing, and then I can go in and I can restore it back to factory defaults. When was the last time this thing probably checked for updates? I wonder if it says find out more about free software from Knoll. It's my favorite company. Do they like ever run updates on this thing at all? They probably like never ran updates on this thing. Well, isn't that just great for system security? Jesus. All right. Well, before I close out this video, I guess we'll try out this Acer e-recovery management as a loud Jeep passes by our house because of course it does. Um, it looks like We've got a section for backup points. Hey, looks like we do have a system factory default thing. We could try that. Because honestly, to be fair, I mean, it is cool that some of the stuff that's on here is on here. But to be fair, I have no idea how many viruses are on this. If there are any that are lurking in the background that Microsoft Security Essentials didn't pick up. And I also would like to clean off all the original owner's pictures and documents because I have no use for them. So... In any case, I suppose I will also make this its own video because while I did the same thing... No, actually, I didn't do the same thing with that one over there. That was the Athlon 64 X2 unit. I did not do that. But basically, this will be the exact same software. It's just for Windows Vista Home Basic, not necessarily for Windows Vista Home Premium. So it's a little different. But in any case, I digress. So that'll wrap up this machine. It'll also wrap up this video that I've unnecessarily gone on long enough about. So... I guess with that having been said, if you like what you saw and you're looking for the newer content, then thumbs up. If you didn't like it so much, well, then, you know, what else to press? Get subscribed down below and click the bell so you don't miss when I upload new videos. And with that having been said, thank you all very much for coming to watch. And hopefully I'll catch you all in the next one.